Welcome to Kurt's Angle, the second ever episode. Now, if you listen to my podcast with Thunder Rosa, you'd see that I'm going solo. I'm flying solo now. I'm still with the Ringsider boys, Jamie and Callum, but we're still. I'm I'm going to do my own little thing, working with different content creators, different wrestlers, to bring you stuff that I wouldn't normally bring on the weekly Ringsider shows. But I'm not going solo for long. Today, I've got a very special guest. She's my favourite queen. And I've met the Queen of England, so that's high praise for this one. She is, to me, one of the best content creators out there at the moment. She's my old brain buster sister, the Queen of N.E. Queen, thank you for joining Oh, well, now that I'm blushing, hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me on, Kurt. I'm so excited to be here. No, I'm really happy to have you. Like, <clears throat> when I spoke about Kurt's angle and I told you, you was one of the first people I told, like, hey, going to be still doing the stuff with the boys, but I'm going solo as well. And I wanted you as my my first, like, my first, in, my first episode, essentially. But then... Things happened, obviously, when we were supposed to record. I had my WWE press interview. Yes. And then so I released a Thunder Rosa interview a little bit earlier as well. But I've got you here. You're my first content creator to come on. Like, I've still not even had Jamie and Callum on. You was top of the list. Like, That's boys, right. listen. Sorry, I still love you both, but the Queen is top of that list. Well, and... thank you, Kurt. <laughs> You're welcome. But, yes, yeah, so... How's it going? It's just been Thanksgiving um, across the pond for you guys. It sure has. It's been a wonderful holiday. A couple days off. Lots of food. Lots of time with family and friends. Uh, and, and the food. Did I say food? Uh, the food's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it was super fun. And now, of course, it's uh, it was a cool Thanksgiving because it it was at the end of the, of the month, which it normally is. But it was like later in November than usual due to the calendar this year. Yeah. So now we're like right into December, which was like the coolest <laughs> to, to have that just around the corner. Now it's the holiday season for everybody. So it's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. It'll be nice spending time with family. And actually, I'm going to be away for the in-laws. So I'm going to like the other end of the U. Well, I won't say the other end, but I'm going down south. It's about a five and a half hour drive, which if you're in the UK, that's a really big thing. In America, small by comparison. Um, well just a little bit we have a little more land than you guys i don't know if you noticed but (laughs) yeah so yeah today's episode is one again that i've been waiting to have and i'm kind of glad we held off on it because we've just had nxt absolutely kill it with survivor series which you can hear us discuss in full over on queen's court which has already dropped from when me and Queenie recorded last week. So make sure you check that out. We are going to be discussing the Wednesday Night's Wars, the story so far. Now, Queen, what was your thoughts when we had AEW was going on Wednesday nights and NXT was like, hey, you know what? We're going on TV and we're going to two hours. And on Wednesdays, and we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> that was my first reaction. I was like, sweet, AUW is right in the middle of the week. This is going to be awesome. And then NXT's like, hold on one second. So are we. And we're going for two hours. And I was like, how well, How am I going to function? Like, what am I going to watch? How am I going to do this? Because normally, right, previous to when it debuted on USA Network, for, for those of us in the States, right, um, for NXT, it's like, I always watched it the next day um on or i watched it on uh, on the network and i would always watch something else or try to catch up on things that i missed and then i would watch nxt later and now i was really concerned because <laughs> i was like wait a minute now they're going to be competing uh same time different channels do i do dual screens that was my first initial reaction right <laughs> off the bat all of these thoughts <laughs> about you i was so excited um but again it's the hours in the day because it's rare that I can watch one of the shows live just right. because it starts either like 12 a.m., 1 a.m. in the morning. That's near enough impossible for me to be doing. 
wouldn't be going to sleep till gone three and I'm up at six for work. So I was like, I can't really do that. Yeah, so when it got announced, I went straight to my gaffer and I was like, hey, I need Thursday off. <laughs> He's like, why? Doing anything nice? I was like, I'm staying up till three o'clock in the morning to watch the debut show of a wrestling company. He's like, oh, okay. Yeah, you can have it off. So... <laughs> I got them. I got the Thursday booked off, so I was like, "Right, AEW, I'm watching this shit live," and I wasn't disappointed. Mm. It's been a it's been an interesting week. Well, interesting nine weeks, should I say, since AEW first aired. What was your thoughts on like that debut episode? With there was so much. Hype, especially going from Double or Nothing. Was it Double or Nothing that you had gone to? I went to All Out. All Out. Yes, yes. Labor Day weekend here in the States, which is uh, <laughs> the end of August, beginning of September. And uh, yep, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're watching Double or Nothing and you're seeing the person, we all guessed he might be there, but was like, is he really going to do the jump? John Moxley came down and beat the living shit out of Kenny Omega. What was your thoughts going into this Wednesday Night Wars? AEW have, obviously, the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Adam Page. Then they've added, well, Cody. they've got Cody Rhodes, of course. Then they've added Chris Jericho to the mix. They've got the Lucha Brothers, and now here comes somebody like John Moxley. What was your thoughts of their initial roster going into things? You know... <laughs> It's funny because my my immediate thoughts were, I'm so excited for this roster. You know, seeing these people perform elsewhere because this is a brand new company, right? So seeing them perform at other promotions and, of course, the Bucks and Kenny and Cody and uh, Adam uh, Hangman Page and New Japan and Ring of Honor, it's it's really cool because I love them so much. So when they announced that they're doing this promotion and then they're going to have this TV show, I'm like hyped about it. And then, you know, obviously Chris Jericho uh, at the presser back all the way back in January, which is such a long time ago now, 12 months ago, basically. And, uh, you know, he's involved. And then you get, you know, John Moxley, AKA for WWE fans, Dean Ambrose. Um, this is a huge deal. And I felt like it was a big deal immediately after double or nothing because i you know i was really excited about it and i knew it was going to be huge just personally right because i i knew it was gonna be huge for me as a fan of these people especially kenny and the bucks that anything they do i'm gonna be into right but when they start adding these other folks to the roster and then you get the lucha brothers and i'm like excuse me (laughs) (laughs) i'm offended in the best way possible that this is actually happening okay great when can i see it like let's go i was offended it was taking so long right but once you add in a john moxley who we can say was arguably the biggest wwe name aside from chris jericho right because obviously he's chris jericho but i mean it in the way like you know chris jericho has been out for a little while he's been doing things with new japan and and doing his own thing with fozzy and doing chris jericho shit basically uh and, and cody had been out for a, a while as well a couple years at this point but moxley was brand fresh spanking new out of the wwe so to have this person join and be so excited about joining this particular roster for me that was like game on let's go no 100 percent. it was it was like the Lex Luger effect. Yeah, where all right. It's the first big guy that's jumped where everybody hyped. And it got to that point in the match, like in the show, where it was like, that motherfucker isn't coming. <laughs> I know, right? He's not going to be here. And they execute it perfectly, in my opinion. I don't think that initial like debut of Moxley couldn't have gone better. Right. The crowd ate it up. The internet was losing their shit. And it was... They've knocked out the ballpark. They've they've started off hot as hell, essentially, moving forward. And I think one of the disappointing things was the Fighter Fest stuff. Mm. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that wasn't... I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. I did enjoy it. But I think 
fans were impatient because they was wanting to wait for All Out, but before then it was Fighter Fest and it was Fight for the Fallen, which were big shows, but they weren't all in. They weren't double or nothing sort of quality. So All Out comes, and this will be interesting because it's your perspective of being there live. Mm -hmm. And this was, to me, the first... Here we go. This is what we're about. What was your thoughts on All Out? You know, <laughs> I feel the same way of what you just said. This was the moment. All Out pay-per-view was the moment that, like, the flag dropped on the race. You know, like, when two cars race and the, the yep. lady drops the checkered flag, like Fast and the Furious. It, we were off. Uh, you know, everything up to this point had been building and building and building towards television, Right. But this pay-per-view, and especially being there live, you could start to really see tangibly what they're going to offer you every single week. Um, the quality of the matches that were there. I mean, just the fact that, and I, I've been saying this a lot, and I know, <laughs> I keep, I feel like a <laughs> robot, I'm repeating it. But 2019 is so crazy wild. Things that we never thought we'd see, we're seeing. And one of those moments was at All Out when Kenny Omega faced, faced uh, Pac. Excuse me. Never would have thought that would have happened like two years ago. So just to even have that in front of you just shows you how insane this TV show is going to be. Just that quality match alone. Never mind the insane ladder match that took place with the Young Bucks and the Lucha Brothers. And, you know, and, and Riho versus Sheeta. And just the the ability of them to put on these quality matches within that four hours. It was something really special. And I'm super glad I was there live to see it. It really did feel like, okay, this is what we're going to give you. And now we're going to take the next four weeks to do press and video packages and, and get you in for our TV debut in October. Uh, it was unbelievable. It was one of the best pay-per-views I've ever been to live. What was your thoughts on the Escalera de la Merta ladder match? One of the best matches of 2019. Um, it was insane. I thought Nick Jackson may have died a few times. I was a little nervous. Some of those yep. spots were brutal, uh, especially um, towards where the ramp was, and he hit his back on that ladder. Oh, my God. It was unbelievable. Uh, it truly was tag team wrestling TLC vibes at its best. Um, I love tag team wrestling in general. Anybody who knows me knows I'm obsessed with tag teams. So AEW was like a beacon of shining light when you have all of these insane people on your roster for tag teams. You know, in my opinion, the best tag team roster going right now, period. So yeah. to see these two, like tag team royalty, arguably two of the best tag teams in the world right now, going in a ladder match, get out of here. I couldn't believe I was watching it. No, from watching at home, it was ridiculous. And yeah. I got to see one of my favorite tag teams turn up in formerly yeah. known as LAX. You got Santana and Ortiz, now known as Proud and Powerful. What was that like seeing? You've just seen two of the best tag teams absolutely kill each other. And now one of the teams that are rivaling them for that mantle of best tag team in the world has just shown up and be like, hey, boys, we're here to play. We got all the nice things this year, I feel like. We got a Kofi Kingston title belt. We had Becky two belts. And now we have LAX going to be feuding with the Lucha Brothers and the Young Bucks. It's just like, I knew they were going to come because after they made their exit from Impact, I was like, there's only one place. There's only one place for them to go that is going to make the most sense and the feuds are going to be epic, and it's AEW. And they came in, and I was, like, punching Mr. Queen in the arm, like, you don't know what's about to happen, but I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, will you stop hitting me? I'm like, no, you don't understand who this is. And then they took off you their masks. Work. Yep, and I lost it, Kurt. I lost it. I knew they were coming, and it didn't matter because I was still so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I love LAX. I, I I feel it sucks that I can't call them that anymore because it just – it. it so easy to remember and and yeah. i uh, so associated with them but proud and powerful is is fine and uh they're in the inner circle now which is unbelievably dope and they're perfect it's perfect no it's fantastic and then we went into week one 
So obviously we've got Chris Jericho is yep. the champ going in as the champion. Over on the black and gold brand, we've got Adam Cole as the NXT champion. And again, they didn't they didn't slow down, did they? They they threw everything they could to make this work. And I want to go with AW first. For the okay. first ever TV show, what was your thoughts on how they went? It was it's not my favorite episode in the past nine weeks, so I'm gonna start with saying okay. that. However, however, the fact that it's the first one of a brand new company on TNT after so many years of not having wrestling on two channels like it used to be, yeah. right? The fact that I could turn this on and watch it, that alone makes it the best episode ever because it's the first one and it's so special. And we saw Pyro and we saw a little old school vibe. We felt that alternative presentation. We got different. We got like full speed ahead it was very hard hitting and it was, here's who we are. Here's what we're going to give you. And we're going to jam pack this two hours. It was the first time in a long time that two hours completely flew by in wrestling. And I was disappointed that there wasn't more. And then they come out with this AEW dark stuff. And I was like, wait, now I get to watch the stuff after the fact. Oh, okay. Now I'm, <laughs> you know, so the fact that they were able to kick this off in such a strong way, mm, everything. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, I've not really been watching the AW Dark stuff just because I don't, I really don't have the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm so behind on different TV shows. I try and catch little bits of it, and I like the fact that they're doing it different. So, when they was in Philly, you had Taz being the commentator for the AW Dark matches, and they're making it seem cool and something different and something fresh, as opposed to hey, these are the guys that weren't good enough to be on TV, like main event and superstars. And the fact that they're counting the matches on AW Dark as part of the standings and statistics going forward. And you saw Ali a few weeks back say, look, you've only seen me on AW Dark where I'm picking up these, like, these points. You will see me soon on Dynamite. I think it's good because it's acknowledging that these guys are on this show and i think that works i think it's given a good platform for those that may not be ready for tv just yet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to still get the exposure so which match did, which show did you watch live did you watch one of them live which one was that yeah um i've watched everything live everything okay. um but I've never been to a taping. I was supposed to go to the Boston one, which was the third show, I think. Yeah. But I didn't. And so of the two of the wars, I've only ever been to the takeovers. Uh, two okay. of them, which was TakeOver um, Brooklyn. Or no, actually, that wasn't called Brooklyn. It was TakeOver New York, which was uh, Mania Weekend. And then yep. I saw TakeOver 25. So, unfortunately, I haven't seen AEW yet. But of the two Wednesday Wars, I have seen NXT. <laughs> okay. So, when you're watching on TV, so it's debut time for AEW on TNT. NXT's over on USA. Did you watch one of those live whilst on TV? Yes. So, originally, I thought maybe I would do two screens. Maybe I would try to, like... I don't know, somehow finagle it. It's just impossible for me. I don't have that type of attention span. I like to pay attention to whatever it is that I'm watching and have singular focus. So I chose to watch AEW live, and I have been doing that ever since it began. And then I watch NXT um, recorded later. So I'll watch it the next day, usually when I get home from work on Thursday afternoon. So that's how I've been doing it since the beginning. Yeah, okay. So mine's always different. I guess sure. I gauge on how the last episode ended. And mm -hmm. I'm loving the fact that both shows are trying to end on like cliffhangers and things like that. I think that's how it should be doing. It shouldn't finish with a sour taste in your mouth, essentially. Sure. Um, like other companies can do. 
I don't want to go, let's look at week six, let's look at week seven, because I think that'll come real stagnant. So, Finn Balor's return. What was your mm. thoughts on Finn Balor's return and everything he's done so far? So, I love Finn Balor a lot. I loved him as Prince Devitt in New Japan. And I was so excited to see him, you know, his first first round in NXT, of course. And then when he was moved to your quote-unquote main roster, as you and I have discussed, it's more of a lateral move now, <laughs> right? But back then, uh, it was an up call. And I was so disappointed with how they've been handling Finn. And, you know, he had that unfortunate shoulder in- injury, which took him out after the Universal title. Uh, he won that. And uh, such a disappointment. So when he came back to NXT, I was like, oh, we're going to get we're going to get something different here. I have a feeling there's no more demon. It's, it, we're going to change entirely. I, I could just taste it. And <laughs> I just knew. And then he comes out and he just says, you know, the prince is back. And like, oh, my heart, I cannot take it. I'm so excited that he is back in the next team with this heel vibe. I'm all for it. Yep. How about you? I was loving it. They went, again, balls to the wall with this. They had Smasher Champa return, but Finn Balor, everything he's done whilst returning, he's executed perfectly. The yeah. coming out to Adam Cole, the crowd lost their shit. The promo where saying, the last time you saw me, I was on my back for the like new best thing in professional wrestling just because somebody put a mask on. And he was like, I'm taking my mask off, and now I'm the best thing in professional wrestling. <laughs> love that. Yes. Absolutely love that. And this is a guy that's been criticised for his promo work in the past, and I was like, this is what you need to do. This More of this. And that heel turn where he kicked Johnny in the head, that couldn't have gone any better. Again, execution was on the button absolutely outstanding stuff and i like how up until week nine they'd been teasing wait is bala actually going to join undisputed era yes and now he's like after the stuff with champer and the posing on this past week and then he does the step forward to do the guns but just but the reason to do that just to give him space to kick call in the head and what a free to be going for the main title at the moment. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, wow, right? <laughs> it's, to, it's crazy, Kurt. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. The fact that these three are going to be fighting for the, the bell, I'm like, wait a minute. Stop. I can't. Some of the, the best in the world right here. It's NXT is, you know, we've spoke on it. And it's NXT is such a special thing. And the fact that now we have this... Oh, you got to be got to be tuning in for that. You got to be tuning in to watch this build because you know it's going to be great. And you're totally right about Finn's promos. If you let him just do this, got it in the bag, buddy. Yep. The prince is back like he really is. And yep. I, even the tease of are we going to get a bullet club? Well, not obviously they can't be called bullet club, but the stuff between Balor and Styles, everything he's done has been outstanding and I think the same goes with Tommaso Ciampa and Adam Cole I think the way them two have carried themselves and during the crossing over with Soup Survivor Series I think them three have been like influential in why NXT to me is currently leading the Wednesday Night Wars I think it's those three because the characters uh, absolutely nailed down and everything they're doing is just must see essentially yeah and especially adam cole i feel like you know he's had a, a crazy crazy end of october november and now of course we're starting in december you know talk about a guy who arguably had the best 2019 across any promotion in the entire world just to watch what he's done over the p- fat past, I'd say maybe five to six weeks, he's incredible. He's an absolute terminator, and just to see the level of hype he's getting, you know, I loved Adam Cole in other places, but I feel like he found what 
we as his fans previously were were wanting for him, and that's yep. that huge spotlight. He's a superstar, and it, he's perfect in NXT. This is what he was made to do. Uh, I, I just truly believe that. Some people, you know, it's like right place, right time, and that's Adam Cole. Yeah. And I and I honestly feel like he is such a large reason why NXT, as you mentioned, is absolutely must see. And his character and the whole vibe between, you know, those top three we were just talking about. But not only them, you know, people like Keith Lee, people like the entire women's division on NXT make yeah. their Wednesday night show something uh, for AEW to be worried about. No, 100%. And I'm glad you mentioned the women because that's what I wanted to go um, into next. But just before we do... On the flip side to the main title in AEW, what's, what's been your thoughts on what Chris Jericho's done and mm. the challenges so far, mainly with Cody Rhodes and Scorpio Sky? What's your, what's your thoughts so far as Jericho's champion and the main billing, what they've been working with so far? I think Chris Jericho is worth every single penny they're paying him and then some. Chris Jericho yeah. has a, a unique ability, as the greatest of all time, to be a chameleon. You know, he's been so many different versions of himself throughout his entire wrestling career. And this one, I, I had no doubt that once he signed and agreed to be part of AEW, that everything he was going to do was going to be money. Straight money. Look at what Chris Jericho can do. This is why he's their champion out the gate, guys. It's... Not only because, uh, you know, it's a smart business move, which it is, right? If you're trying to get casual fans to watch your product, they know the name Chris Jericho if they've been watching WWE for a while. So they're going to be more apt to tune in when they hear names like Jericho and Cody and then, of course, Moxley, who came after those two. But I, And, of course, now we have Jake Hager, who was Jack Swagger. So there, there's, there's things, right, for casual fans to take a look at. Yeah. But why he's real money is the way and ability that he has and only he has to cut a promo. He steps into that ring and shows people how it's done. He can put anybody over. He can put any word over. He can put on a purple blazer with jack-o'-lantern pumpkins and make it look like the best piece of clothing that's ever been worn by anybody. I mean, how can you do that? Only Chris Jericho can do that. So for me, I think it's been spectacular. I love that he wasn't pinned and beaten in any way shape or form until scorpio sky i love the stipulation that cody put himself on the line he said i'm listening to you guys you don't want us to have a title shot right now you don't want us to to do that so i won't challenge again if i lose loved that i love that they're going to stick to that uh but i really enjoyed the so i don't know if you noticed this but after chris jericho won the title at all out they had that backstage uh little promo where he was yelling at everybody because there was no uh, in celebration for him. And that's where we get the a little, a bit, little of, bit of the bubble. Air. There it is, right? So before he does that promo, though, he walks by all these people in the back. And he points right at Scorpio Sky. We can't see him, but Jericho can. And he points at Scorpio Sky and he says, Scorpio Sky, you'll never get a shot at this. And they just plant the seed right there. He could have called out anybody, yeah. right? And then all of a sudden, now we had this stellar match between the two. I wish it was longer. Uh, just, you know, not that long ago. Last week, I, I can't even keep my date straight anymore, Kurt. It's, it's just been so much yep. happening. But uh, finally having that build up and, and be a great match. You know, Chris Jericho, yeah, I understand. Okay, he's older, whatever. And it's, I, I know a lot of people are like, well, in WWE, if you have an older champion, people lose their mind. Da, da, da. All right, whatever. But there's a reason why Chris Jericho is doing what he's doing in a brand new company. And if you can't see that perspective, then I'm not sure we could be friends. Because <laughs> it's just, it's smart. It's smart business. He got over champagne. It became a shirt that sold out. It became actual bottles of champagne that, yes, I bought and are coming to my house. <laughs> you know, it's like, how? How, Chris Jericho? How do you do these things? <laughs> yeah, anything he touches turns to gold. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he's helped Sammy Guevara come into his sure. own massively and yeah his build with um his build so far with cody and with scorpio has been 
outstanding. And I think Scorpio's been one of my favourite things of this Wednesday Night War because he's been, he's been the guy, essentially. He's he stepped up when a lot of people didn't think he would be able to. Like When you thought about people challenging for the title, nobody ever thought about Scorpio Sky. And mm. I think he's just taken it to a whole other level over <clears throat> since going live and proven a point, and rightly so. But jumping back to the women, you mentioned they make it must-see. And you've just seen Shayna Baszler winning the main event of Survivor Series over Becky Lynch and Bailey. You've just seen Shayna go to war with Rhea Ripley um, in war games. That also had what Bianca Belair, Io Shirai, Kaylee Ray. Then you had Candice LeRae. You're supposed to have Dakota Kai and Tegan Knox. Like everything they're doing so far has been absolutely stellar with with that. With the build of Dakota Kai ten in heel, and you're gonna get Dakota and Tegan going at it. All the stuff with me and Yim at the moment. You've had Candice LeRae and Io Shirai going going at it and you've got Rhea Ripley and you've got Shayna Baszler how are your thoughts to the fact that there's three big feuds that you could have all three of those matches on a pay-per-view and not be bored like it is it wouldn't be there because it's it wouldn't feel like you're only putting that on to show that you support women you're putting them on because it's three absolutely incredible feuds that all three of them will try and steal the show that's, you said what's it perfectly right on, there. Yeah, what's your thoughts on all of that in comparison to what AEW were doing with their women's division? I don't think you can even compare because NXT is doing it way better. So I'm going to start off by saying uh, I am a huge fan of AEW. I am a huge fan of most of their roster. I'm not a huge fan of how they're booking this division. And I have some other things to say about that, but I want to start there. Looking at NXT, looking at what they have, I feel like they they're just hitting the booking and the character development and the stories much better than any women's division. And that includes Raw and SmackDown. In fact, I think NXT outshines them altogether. And yes, that includes Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair. I think by far NXT is is showing that they have the strongest storyline, creative, and talent in the way that they're able to execute. You could have Candice LeRae versus Io Shirai, a main event, and it would be amazing. You could have Rhea Ripley come out and take on Shayna Baszler, and people would have their mouth open, salivating, ready for that match. You know, Rhea Ripley has just had, like Adam Cole, but in a shorter time span, you know, she had like a a week stretch of, holy shit, Rhea, just wow. Just unbelievable showcase of her talent. And there's so much more that they can offer, and their storylines right now aren't based off of things that we're seeing on Raw, like, oh, look, I'm cheating on my husband with this other guy, and now I'm divorcing it. We're not getting that, right? Or we're not getting the, oh, look, someone betrayed Natalia again as her friend, supposed friend, and now they're feuding. <laughs> we're not getting that. We're getting, like, actual, let's fight because we're great fighters, and let's showcase how we wrestle. Like, let's just do that. Yeah, we have best friends things, but I think the way that they did Dakota Kai and Tegan Knox was 10 million times better than how they've booked, like, the, the betrayal of, you know, poor Natalia. So I feel like... Because you care about it. I care about it. That's it, Kurt. I care about it because I'm invested in these women. I'm invested in their characters. And I'm invested them completely showing out. It's not like anything else that's going on in WWE right now. And it's certainly not anything going on in AEW. Uh, Just from what I can see. Having been watching them both for these past nine weeks. You know... And there's a lot to say about AEW too, but I want to hear obviously your thoughts on on NXT, the women. Yeah, I think like again you hit it on the head, and I think with NXT UK as well, coming up to Blackpool Takeover in January, you've got three of the best women that have helped build the British wrestling scene in Kaylee Ray, who you saw at War Games, 
Tony Storm that you saw at Survivor Series that I imagine will be moving across to America shortly to join the Wednesday black and gold brand. And then you've got Viper, well, Piper Niven, should I say. So mm-hmm. you've got those You've got those three. Like, to me, when, when I was at the recent NXT UK TV tapings, I called them the trinity of women's wrestling here in the UK. So you've got the possibility of piping up and going across. You've got Kaylee Ray that's dipping her toes in the American water. You've got Tony Storm that's about to go out there. Mm-hmm. Then... I love her. <laughs> <laughs> but then you've got Rhea that Rhea is what Becky was seven months ago or eight months ago. Like, she's the cool, she's the badass, but she's, we said it on your show. I said, Rhea Ripley is everything Becky Lynch should have been. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just so, it's so cool. And you know what I like about Shayna Baszler? Although she backed down from Rhea and was like, we ain't fighting right now. She's not a chicken shit heel. Right. She doesn't run. Rhea Ripley's there talking trash. So she's like, hey, I'll jump up on the apron, do what you want. And that's what I like. People can be heels without being a chicken shit, essentially. They can be heels and know that they're a badass and they'll rip the arm off everybody, anybody in front of her and not have to run away. And I think they're only touching the surface with Jasmine Duke and Marina Shafir as well. What's going to happen with Mia Yim when she returns? Because it's going to be clearly Dakota Kai that attacked her. Right. And that moment when Tegan Knox will get her hands on Dakota Kai is going to be fantastic. And we're getting the smoke show herself. Scarlett Hall, she's heading over to the NXT, NXT, which I cannot wait. Like When I got to meet her in All In That... That made my trip to Chicago worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> just to just to throw that out there, like, and I, she looks great. She's got a character spot on, and she's fantastic in the ring. And we didn't really get to see that in Impact Wrestling. And I think, um, well, I'm hoping we're going to see that. Like, the girl can be wearing the six inch heels and pull out Canadian destroyers for the fun of it. Like, she can go, and. It's just so star-studded, whereas I don't really look at the AEW women's roster and think that person's a star. Mm. You've well, got Rio that, to me, yeah. has been built underwhelmingly. Mm-hmm. After Nyla Rose lost, you've not really seen her. Britt Baker, like, I, I upset a lot of people on Twitter when she showed up on NXT. I was like, wow, they've done better for her. They've hyped her more than an AEW have. Like, look, I know she's had a lot of... It's the booking decisions that... It's been very 50-50. Or should we say, it's been very 25-25-25-25 with, like, the four main women. It's... They did Rio and Emi Sakura and didn't do any real build... All it took was to do a vignette or two talking about their history, and then you've just sold why that's important. But instead, you have somebody like Emi Sakura that the crowd couldn't really care about because you've not tried telling the story of who she is and why she's there, and that she's one of the most badass women on the planet when it comes to professional wrestling. They've not built anybody, really, in my opinion, I have to admit, like I don't want to just criticize Brandy Rhodes. I love the fact that she's changing her gimmick, like full on changing her gimmick. And I'm liking the stuff that she's doing with Awesome Kong because it's something new and different. But apart from apart from them like building that too, have they built anybody? Have they tried tell, telling a story with anybody? Have they built any characters? I don't think they have. What's your thoughts? This is a tough one. So, a <clears throat> couple things right off the bat. I feel like Riho has gotten herself over. As, you know, if you've seen her wrestler elsewhere, she does the same thing. She's just so lovable, it's hard not yeah. to, right? She's just that 
that charismatic. She doesn't have to do much, and it just kind of exudes off of her, which I think is wonderful. Um, I think that the only feud that they built was between B. Priestley and Britt Baker. And that's what they were trying to build. And it was the only thing that got significant attention. However, there was really no massive payoff for that. They put it on the buy-in. Yeah, which was fine. Um, but I would have preferred to see Sean Spears versus Joey Janela on the buy-in and put that on the main card. They need more women matches. They, it needs to continue to happen in order for it to get better. That's just how I feel. They don't have a performance center like NXT. They don't have a place where they do that. And in, and in addition, they also have this thing where they let their performers perform elsewhere, which I think is amazing because it lets you get an experience. It lets you challenge different wrestlers it lets you be free as a as a creative professional to do what you want to do wherever you would like to do it um which i think is awesome but it also hurts them right because people then aren't available at certain times yeah so they have to be prepared for that if they're going to let them do that which i think they should by the way i'm not saying that they shouldn't i just think they need to be prepared for that um i think they needed to build the emmy sakura riho thing as well like those of us who knew who they were didn't have a problem with it because we already knew but the vast majority of people don't. The crowd so, was flat. The, the crowd, crowd was, was flat so for cool. them. But I will say, Emmy was able to put herself over in the last couple of weeks um, from that match um, that where they fought at full gear. Uh, that tilt world backbreaker was just a sight to behold. And I feel like people got a little bit more behind after that. But the problem I have is we have a way too long segment with Cody Rhodes and a limo with Tony Schiavone. Yeah. So you're telling me you can do that for that amount of time, but you can't cut me like a two minute video vignette about Riho versus Emi Sakura. Are you kidding? Like mm-hmm. this is wasted opportunity to me. Like the Sean Spears, Joey Janela match. They put more behind that than this women's championship match. And I don't like that. I think that that's a poor booking and poor creative. I think that that's trash and they need to fix it. You know, a lot of the problem, too, is, uh, you know, I heard Kenny speak about it on Wrestler Observer Radio. And there's been some stuff going around Twitter, you know, uh, of uh, people writing the transcript of what he said. And uh, to paraphrase poorly, I'm sure. But essentially, <laughs> he was like, you know, I don't want to say wait till 2020, but wait till 2020. Things are going to get better. Da, 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 da. And I hear that whole thing that he said. I really do. I hear that argument. And I, too, understand, right, that a lot of this is new. They are a brand new baby company. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do things that we don't all agree with, right? Um, and, and that's not their job to please everybody. Just like it's not the job of NXT or WWE or any other promotion to please anyone. They can't do it. They have to do uh, what they feel that they want to do. It's their business and their company. They can please a large majority, but they won't make everybody happy, right? However... Yeah. That being said, while I do understand and I'm willing to give you a little bit more of a take it with a grain of salt vibe, you are able to build the men's matches no problem. So I see no reason why you can't do the same for the women. I also feel like the new signings of Big Swole and uh, the potential signing of Shanna and Chris Statlander, who they just booked, by the way. Shan- yeah. Shanna has week. signed. It's Chris Statlander. That's the potential. Okay, Shanna did sign because on the last week's AEW Dark, she had said she hadn't signed yet or wasn't signed with them. She put out a tweet herself and said that. So I'm glad that they ended oh. up working that out. Yeah, so Maybe I'm not, glad that not. that happened. Yeah. Um, she's phenomenal and excellent. But Chris Statlander, who, in my opinion, had one of the best 2019s of any wrestler, male or female, um, to have her looking like she's going there is a huge win. For them, she's extremely talented. Yeah, she's a little bit green. She's new-ish, but she's not like uh, other people. And I feel like she's got really something special. She could be huge for them. And they just booked her against Sheeta for this Wednesday's AEW Dynamite. So I'm really excited about that. So they're doing yeah. the they're doing better things in the past couple of weeks. But a lot of the better things had been on AEW Dark. <laughs> so yeah. I would like them to fix that. That's where I'm at with the women's division. And I feel like... You know, a lot of people who are just on the AEW train are like, you can't be too negative. They're brand new. And while I understand, you still have to speak out about what's wrong or what yes. you feel is is wrong. So I'm not sure how you feel about the the ladies, but that's kind of where I'm I'm at with them. I'm a little frustrated. 
they've got the they've got the talent. They've just not been telling the story. Mm-hmm. Like I'd like to see more getting used with Penelope Ford as well. Yes, not just a valet. Nope. But in the same grand scheme of things, I'd prefer a lot more for Kip Sabian. Mm-hmm. They they're listening to fans. They've they've signed Big Swall because people wanted it. They're trying to sign Shanna and uh, Chris Statlander because again they've done well. I'm liking Hikaru Shida. I'd I'd never heard of her before this, mm-hmm. and I'm enjoying her stuff. I like the fact that. They make everybody mean somebody, something. So Jimmy Hater. If that was in a different company, she hasn't had her entrance. But here, they've got entrance music and they tell her where she's come from. So they did a little bit of storytelling. Look, she's the tag partner of B Priestley. I'd love to see more of Jamie Hater and B Priestley as a duo in AEW. Mm-hmm. There's... Like... What's happening with Azure Kong? Like, I know mm. we should be patient, but this are they telling the long are they playing the long game with Awesome and Azure having the match? I, I don't I don't know where they're gonna go with that one, but I think maybe. they need to wear <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I don't know, maybe. Let's hope so, because if not, I'm gonna be really mad. <laughs> yeah. No, hundred percent. Like yeah. I think they need to work on Debuts better. Butcher and the Blade have such a good look. And I'm loving the fact that Ali is now the bunny. However, Ali got the biggest pop when she popped up. Because people knew who she was. Butcher and the Blade, not many people know who they were. And I think it's some naivety. Yeah, they may be popular in their home promotion. But this is global television now. Like... Base, I, I didn't like it. People shit on WWE for the exact same thing of not doing vignettes, not telling the story of who these people are. But at least the people that are appearing in WWE have been elsewhere, so a lot more people know them. Nobody really knew Butcher and the Blade. And I think that hurt him massively. I think it hurt Dark Order massively. And they're redeeming that with the amazing recruitment videos these past two weeks. What's your thoughts on the way AEW are presenting their new stars that haven't been in WWE? Um, <laughs> I really honestly think that this is one of their weakest points. You know, from the Dark Order to Wardlow to the Butcher and the Blade with Ellie the Bunny. Uh, they're just not good at it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on. But they need somebody who's like good at at surprises or something. Yeah. They, it's they need to have somebody who who's got that creative vibe for how to introduce new people. Also, we just saw Wardlow attack Cody, and now we're gonna have these people attack Cody. Like, why are we all attacking Cody? I don't, what, what's yeah. happening? You know, it just it doesn't make sense. And also, why does he have to come to the middle of the ring for that? Why can't we have yeah. something where he's walking backstage to come out and make an announcement and he gets freaking ambushed yeah. at the top of the ramp? Like he comes out and does his little Star Trek entrance thing where the chandelier comes out and then pop out from the from the bottom are these Butcher and the Blade with Allie and she could just stand over and put her heel right on his chest and call it a day. Maybe exactly. they need to hire me. <laughs> yes. I, well, as you was on about the, the ramp, I was like, actually, they could have had it where he'd have just popped up. Like, they'd have popped up with him. Yeah. And that would have been so much better. You don't even have to see the attack on Cody. Yep. But. Just have him laid out. Just laid out yep. on the thing that comes out of the floor. And her heel right on top of his chest with her arms on both of these dudes. And just straight laughter from her. And silent menacing from them. And then just yep. have them, like, drag his body off through the tube. Uh, that they have there on either side and call it a day. Like that would have been the coolest thing. And people would have been like, who are those guys? What's going on? How do what? Like, we need to figure out who they are. That's how you create intrigue. You don't do that. But I mean, the coming to the floor thing, like, hello, we see that all the time. Kane, the fiend. I don't need it on an EW too. Why, why, why did it happen? Why with the dark order? I could see that, but why would it happen with butchering the blade? We don't know. 
but nothing about those screamed a dark mystical thing where they live under the ring. No, not at all. Like I know she's you know like the demon bunny right from from Impact, but that's not what this is. Rosemary's not here yet, so you know <laughs> I wish we'll think yeah my part, but uh, you know it just it could have been done so much better, and I feel like it does them such a disservice. And not only that, but the commentary having no idea who they are that does not help either. Yeah, one of you needs to know, the other one needs to play dumb and be quiet and let the person who knows do some explaining. You don't need to know why they attack Cody just yet. Right? They, yeah, like, if they do it right, it's a conversation piece. But if you yeah. do it wrong, it's what the hell is going on? Yeah, I think Jim Ross kind of sucked the, the little life it had. Yeah, I agree. He kind of buried him out the shot. And it's not his point. Like, again, that goes to management. Hey, Jim, look, these guys are coming in. Here's some of the footage of their work. This is what their character is going to be about. Can you put it over for us? Not him not know the names and not really know what anything about them. Yeah. Because if, Ju- if Jim Ross doesn't know who you are, then that means you're not worth him knowing. Essentially. like it, Yeah, it doesn't look very great. nice. No. Now, it, was, it was frustrating, but I want to go over to the tag team. Um, we... we Briefly spoke about it with mm-hmm. the Lucha Bros, the Young Bucks, uh, P&P. We've also got... What's your thoughts on Jurassic Express? Oh, I just love Luchasaurus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our pal JPQ, uh, we were texting um, during like the first couple of uh, hours of this premiere. And, and you just see like how over dinosaurs are is crazy. Like people just go nuts for him. And uh, rightfully so, you know, he's huge, 6'5". He's a dinosaur. Like what's happening in life? And I think his pairing with Jungle Boy is the absolute sweetest thing on the planet. Like when he just yep. rises up from the back and he's on Luchasaurus's shoulders and they're just walking to the ring casually, like a boy and his dinosaur, I cannot. And then you add... Um, Marco stunt to that, and it's just like, how do you hate this? <laughs> it's so damn cute. <laughs> Marco stunt gets a lot of hate. He does. To me, I'd make him wrestle in the dynamo- dinosaur mask. I wouldn't have it as an entrance thing. I'd have him wrestle in it. Ooh, as baby Dino, like they've had on the being the lead and uh, their YouTube yeah. stuff and Twitter stuff. Yep. Yeah. I'd have him wrestle in his mask, mm. personally. And I loved Jungle Boy. He's fantastic. He's going to be a future world champion. And I think that's the reason why JR calls him Jack Perry as well and Jungle Boy Jack. So let's face it, Jungle Boy, is that going to be a world champion? Maybe not. However, Jungle Boy Jack Perry would be. Mm, I like where you're going with this. That's why Jim keeps. I hope that's the case. Um, and I think he's got the looks of it. Like they showed him, I think it might be on one of the being the elites doing a photo shoot, and I was like, he just looks like a star. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts on how SCU have been portrayed? I freaking love SCU. <laughs> yep. I just love them, and whenever they just Scorpio comes on the mic and just goes ah. And then you know it's coming. And you're like, yes! I'm so hype. And they're so fun to watch live, by the way. And they're a great way to start any show. They just have that hype around them. And people love SCU. However, if Scorpio Sky doesn't go on an independent run as a single star soon, I'm going to lose it. (laughs) I love him by himself. And I really don't like Christopher Daniels right now with this whole Pentagon thing. I'm like over it. I don't know if that's probably just me. But like I'm tired of seeing him in a in a Pentagon mask, and or I, I a Ray Phoenix mask, or exactly or Ray, I'm over that. I don't want that. Just go back to being SCU. Like I know they attacked you and whatever and put you out on injury. Okay, you could get your comeuppance on them once, and then I'm good. Like leave it alone. <laughs> it's too much. Not, they do not, a lot of this run in stuff. Yeah. So are the Lucha Brothers actually for that point. They do a lot yeah. of this run up and attack BS. I'm over that too. They got to stop it. Yeah, even. The whole Pentagon thing, we've seen that so many times. Like, somebody dressed as Pentagon. It's not fresh. 
it'd have had a bigger impact if he was the fallen angel. The lights go on. There's Daniels in the fallen angel kind of gimmick mm-hmm. of where, mm-hmm. oh shit, this attack's broken him because he's seen his boys go win the tag titles without him. And that would have worked. But dressing up as Pentagon, dressing up as Phoenix, yeah, it's yeah, I'm not loving it too. But as a collective, with with the way Frankie and Scorpio have been, they, they've been fantastic. To like really a a good story. When I was at All In, I did um, one of the meet and greets where I was having a cigar with Cody and Frankie Kazarian, one of the American Rebel cigars, mm-hmm. and. Scorpio came in and he was like, "Oh, my bad, my bad. I best go." And he was like, "No, have a have a cigar with us." And Scorpio was like, "Really? I can stay?" He was like, "Well, if you don't mind." And then just starts pulling out a cigar, smoking, and talking to all the fans. And <laughs> then Christopher Daniels came in and he joined in with it all. And it was just such a pure, natural. Like everybody had such a good vibe. I'm sure it was the same with All Out for you. It was such yes. a good positive vibe with the fans, with the guys. Everything was great. Hundred percent, and it was the exact same way all out. Um, it it what I love about what AEW is doing for their live things and and partnering with Starcast and doing all of that. Uh, it really feels accessible and personal. You know, WWE yeah. is always feels like unattainable in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not it's harder to to meet them and have that same type of connection like you can with the AEW roster. Um, and even NXT, you know, like you could do stuff when they go to evolve or whatever, but I, I really feel like having been in both live shows, uh, AEW is way more personal. It feels more like a fan's promotion uh, than anything else. And that's what I love about what they do on TV. Uh, yeah. It feels like you're, you're there and you're a part of it even at home. And that's just something super special for, for me, as you know, I, I can't really take the slog of watching weekly WWE television. It, it gets cumbersome after a while. It's just a lot of stuff to consume, and I'd rather just watch NXT. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Raw and SmackDown for me are way less on my totem pole. But yeah. Wednesday shines so bright for AEW because it's such a different feel, and that's what I love about NXT. NXT feels personal, uh, especially when it when it first started, it was such a small thing that not a lot of people watched, and it was that underground indie type of vibe, even in WWE, and that's what makes it so unique, as opposed to the other two in WWE. No, hundred percent, and we've we spoke about how good Adam Cole's been mm-hmm. in the Undisputed Era. Like, what's your thoughts on total of how Undisputed Era have been portrayed since the war started? Dude, Undisputed is top dogs. Um, They're holding all the gold. They've been showing out. They put in the most work at Survivor Series uh, that whole weekend for more games on. And and even that whole week, (laughs) they were everywhere, those those four, which was excellent. Um, You know, they've they've been really showing out as as being this very strong united faction. Their personalities are over the top, but not in like a bad way. You know, they're very large yeah. personalities. They're funny. They're heels, but they're lovable, which is a unique thing. And as and as far as their presence, they're a very dominating presence and their wrestling is top notch. It's it's hard to to argue against that. No, hundred percent. Like they're you could say they're the elite right now. <laughs> well um, yeah, a little bit. I think so. Going across to that, like Going into it, everyone's like, ah, they'll just make themselves champions. But now everyone's like, ah, they're just ruining themselves. Like, Cody's booking's been brilliant so far, in my opinion. The whole Sean Spears stuff, the whole stuff with Jericho, now with MJF. Mm-hmm. Who, we've not really mentioned, but MJF has stepped it up. In my, he's been fantastic. He's a dick, but mm-hmm. he's been fantastic. Yeah, However, he's perfect for that way. I want to talk... We'll start off with Adam Page. How do you think he's been used so far? Ooh. Well, I mean, I didn't think he would be the first champion. I liked how he was built. But since then, I've, I've kind of gotten a little bit bored with him. Yeah. 
I'm um, I'm not sure what cowboy shit is. I'm not, I don't understand. I've asked my friend Anthony from Texas <laughs> over at Smart to Death. I'm like, hey, buddy, you know what this means? <laughs> and he's like, I think we have different definitions of cowboy shit. And I'm like, I, I think we do, too. Um, and it's not to say that I, do, I don't like him. But for me, he's very typical. It's, you know, the buckshot lariat. Um, I know that I'm going to see it. And I don't really care for anything else. I don't know. I, I had a lot of high hopes for him. Um but right now it's just not connecting for me. Yeah, the I struggle also... to keep fresh. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it is. It's tough to keep fresh and um he's being pushed back in the spotlight a little bit with um the feuds they've put him in and then with MJF for the ring. And I would have liked to see somebody else, I think. I would like Paige to take a little bit of a step back and do a rebuild. Cause I think he'd be excellent again in the chase. Like he was with Jericho before all out. Yeah. I think he needs a friend cause he's leaving the elite. I think he needs a friend, a very villainous friend. If you catch my drift. Whoop, whoop. Yep. <laughs> Marty, Marty. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, I, I so hope. And like, obviously PCO and Brody King and flip their contracts are coming up. And man, I'd love if the villain club, like if all three of them jumped across. Oh, wouldn't it be great? Yeah, and if they did like, if they made the hangman like a darker character, like a more villainous character, it'd be, he need, he needs something. He needs a big change. And I think that might be why he's been given all these opportunities because he squandered all of them. And that mm. might be what they tell with the character development. Mm. That's what's, a good thought. What's your thoughts on the books? Obviously, they lose. Uh, they lose the ladder match. They lose in the first round to Private Party. They lose to LAX. Like they ain't doing good. <laughs> what's your thoughts on? Do you think they're underbooking themselves? No, actually, I, I actually don't. Um, I think that this is kind of perfect. Um, I like that they're coming into this company not dominating. I think that that's really smart. It lets them have interesting storylines. It lets them put over new tag teams private party for example um i think that that's really special i like that they were a little cocky right and then they got destroyed in round one (laughs) of the tournament it makes things interesting you know young bucks have been at the top for so so long and that's not a bad thing but if they were continuing to be at the top of their own company while cody is at the top while kenny is rebuilding to the top i think it'd be too much so Somebody had to take the fall, and I'm kind of glad it was the Young Bucks. I think it's great. And now that Matt is, you know, quote, unquote, injured, and Nick's getting to do his thing a little bit, it's just showing us the potential of what's to come and that they'll still be a cool tag team, but they'll have, like, you know, they have these moments of, like, okay, I'm injured, I'm out, and I'll let you shine kind of thing. You know, it it makes things uh, atypical of what we're expecting, and that's what I like about it. No, yeah, I I can see that. Like, if they dominate straight away, they'd get still very quickly. But it's just worrying if I really enjoyed Nick and Phoenix. That was that was such a good match. Mm-hmm. What about Kenny though? Like, a lot of people are saying they've ruined Kenny Omega already. Like, what's your thoughts on the Kenny Omega we've been getting? As opposed to the one we've been used to over in Japan. Uh, As a huge Kenny Omega fan um, myself, I don't agree that they've ruined Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega in Japan was a chapter of Kenny Omega. And now that chapter is closed and we're moving on to something else. He's still going to give us great matches. He's still going to be the bout machine. But he's a different Kenny. Um, He's not quite babyface, but he's not quite heel either. He's kind of living in this little random area. He's more babyface than heel, but it's still kind of unsure of where we're going. 
it's a lot of intrigue, a lot of like Kenny's losing his mind or what's going on with him. And now he's in death matches, like what's going on? And it's a lot of that kind of thing. And I think a lot of people who were very used to the quality and level of match that he was having in New Japan, I can see why this is a little bit startling for them. I don't think it's bad, though. You know, we've seen Kenny go to war with the best wrestler in the world right now, which is Okada, in my opinion. I think he is yep. the best right now. Um, we've seen that chapter already. We've seen the elite chapter of Kenny. We've seen Bullet Club Kenny. We've seen, um, you know, back in the old, old days of Kenny Omega with his, you know, more video game type character and references. And now it's a new chapter. And I think that we need to see what's going to happen with him. You know, it's been a, a slow build back to the top for him, right? He's been losing and wasn't looking too great. But he's, you know, really focused on doing other things. You know, he's more focused on the trying to build the women and bring uh, Joshi wrestling to the United States that, you know, that's something that we have to applaud, I think, as a Kenny fan, that he's more concerned with uh, doing that than even his own matches. He said, I'd rather you take time from what I'm doing and push them. It's just a different Kenny. And I think people have to understand that we're not going to be getting the same thing. And that's not to say it's because, and I've heard the argument too, I don't know if you've seen this, but he's not the same Kenny because of the the quality of wrestlers isn't the same in AEW. That's a bunch of trash. I don't like that <laughs> argument. They're totally different. They're different. Japanese wrestling is not the same. <laughs> it's just not. Uh, the way that they book things and, and their long-term storytelling and the, and the hardcore champions that they have over there, not hardcore wrestling, but actual, like, they defend their belts for a long time, typically, right? Uh, it's very different than what we're getting in AEW. There's a lot of talent over here. So I don't think it's that. I mean, you're putting another one of the best wrestlers in the world, by the way, uh, Pac, in with Kenny Omega, and you're telling me that that's not good enough for you? Get out of here. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I think everybody was expecting that Japan-style match where a lot of the no-selling and things like that, but they're telling more of a story, and I don't think people have been able to come to grips with that. Me, personally, I loved it what he and Moxley did. Mm -hmm. I thought they've done really good storytelling. Their match was brutal as hell. And it was like, oh shit, this really is a different side to Kenny, which we've not been used to seeing. But mm -hmm. I think it was one of those, there was damned if they pushed them, but now they're damned that they're not. Mm -hmm. And with wrestling fans, you can't win. There was always going to be those that had to complain either way it went. I kind of, yeah. we're only scratching the surface with all five of them. And the fact that they've not, excuse my um, pun, but blown the load with all five of them straight out the bat, it's, no, they can keep giving you small doses until you get the finished thing. And to a lot of people, it's introducing them to a, maybe a different audience in terms of, the casual fans that may just find it on TNT. Yeah. So, going to the ratings, I'm not one that looks in ratings like, I don't care, I enjoy it, I just judge which one I preferred. But, as it stands, AEW got the first seven. During the Survivor Series stuff, NXT pipped it, made it 7-1. And now... They went to 7-2, but with AEW dropping to just over 600,000 viewers. What's your thoughts on those figures? Would AEW be worried going from, in nine weeks, dropping from 1 mil to 663,000? Um, I'd say yes and no. I think that, I, I too, I'm not a ratings person. But if it was my business, like if I was in, involved in the business end of either of these two promotions, then yes, I'd be paying attention. But as a fan, what I have to say is, who gives a shit? Watch what you want and enjoy it. But yeah. uh, if you're looking at it that way, you know, there's a lot of other factors as well. Uh, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of playoff games going on. There's football, uh, which is American football here. Um, not soccer, which we call soccer, <laughs> which is your football. Very confusing. Anyway, uh, so there's that. We have a lot of things uh, happening. We had the holidays. It's the holiday season. There always is a dip, um, I feel like, in wrestling uh, until we kind of 
push out into the new year. And then we start getting like, you know, the bill for rumble and things like that. So I'm not surprised. Right. Yeah. But uh, they, and then they had a wrestling show the night before Thanksgiving, people are traveling, you know, it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, I think they need to be concerned in the, uh, if they're not maintaining numbers, right. If they're yeah. not keeping the people who are watching it, then that's the real problem. They need to worry about maintaining and then rebuilding those numbers back up. I think they were so high out of the gate because they're new and, you know, people like shiny new toys, right? Now it's all about sustaining those numbers. And I think that's for both NXT and for AEW, but AEW specifically considering they had the lowest drop of the two. And I think NXT got a little more hype because of Survivor Series. So I think in the next couple of weeks and then into the new year will be the true test of the numbers and whether or not they need to be truly concerned. Yeah, no, that's a fair statement. Like, so in your mind, because we're calling it the Wednesday Night Wars, so who's winning in your eyes? If which one of you prefer, like you preferred, and if the wrestling god came to you, which I guess it's kind of Vince McMahon, if he came <laughs> to you, was like you can only watch one of them for the rest of time, NXT or AEW, which one are you going for? Well, the real winner here, Kurt, is the fans. But if I have to pick one, I'm going to watch AEW. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay, okay. I'm going to watch AEW because it's new and different. And it has nothing to do with any other cross-promoting on other brands. I don't have to deal with Raw SmackDown crossover stuff. And while NXT is excellent and I enjoy it, I want to watch AEW because I feel like feel like this is a revolution in wrestling, and I want to be a part of that. But you can't make me do it for all time. Vince McMahon, god of wrestling. Because <laughs> I'm the queen, goddammit, and I watch what I want to watch. <laughs> the queen has spoken. The queen has... I'm not going to argue with that. No, I agree. <laughs> like, I'm invested in AEW. Yes. As a, as a fan, I'm invested. There's a reason why the one and only time I've been to America was for All In in Chicago. Like, I've always wanted to do a WrestleMania, not taking the leap, but when I knew these guys was putting on this show, I was like, I have to be there. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just it's gonna be nice just to see them from the start of the journey. Like I, I loved watching TNA growing up. And th- this this things like the the testing things, seeing what works. I think the being a little bit too WWE mm-hmm. with the whole Jericho Festival thing. Mm-hmm. At the beginning mm-hmm. of this week, I think that went on for way too long. I agree. But again, they're doing some great stuff and it's just the beginning of the story. They're going to be bringing in more people and it's all new. Like everything's new for us essentially in terms of what characters and I think when um the certain a certain villain does jump across, I think that's going to be huge. And I'm 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 excited to see where it goes. I really am. And to me it's my favorite Thursday is my favorite day for wrestling because I wake up, I'll watch one of them whilst I'm getting ready and on my way to work and on the commute to work and then I'll watch the other when I'm at when I'm home from work or during my lunch I'll start watching it like I'm committed to watch both shows on that Thursday I'm really like I'm really enjoying it and what a time to be alive for <clears throat> for wrestling and it's going to be interesting to see where it goes in terms of what happens when there's more contracts like ending Mm-hmm. The likes of uh, Luke Harper, he's trademarked his Brody Lee name. These people like the Hart Foundation over at MLW, if they ever made the jump, I think that'd be a big splash for either one of the companies if you if they went there. I think with John Morrison, we still don't know what he's going to be doing. 
is he going to turn up on Raw or SmackDown or is he going to go to AEW or NXT? Like, there's so many pieces to the chess game that could happen and it's going to be it's going to be exciting. I agree. Very so, exciting stuff, Kurt. Very exciting stuff. No, I've well, I've, I've enjoyed dissecting it all, to be honest, and seeing what your thoughts have been. Um, I think some of them have been similar. Some have maybe gone the other way. I think they... I'd like to see the books get pushed a little bit more, personally. But it's going to be interesting. It's. I don't want them to be losing everything. I, I want the wars with LAX. I want the wars with Proud and Powerful. Like, there's so... They're so their their tag division is stacked. I think sure. they've they've got the strongest tag division out of the two. I think you if you remove Fish and O'Reilly, what tag teams have you got in NXT? Yeah, there's a tough it's a tough spot for them. Their tag team division is uh, is not very good at all. It's low. It's low, low, low. Yep. Whereas AWs, it's it's growing. Like it's not perfect people. It sh- it shouldn't be. Um, I think if people were saying it was perfect, I think we'd have our blind spots just because of our distaste for current WWE products on Raw and SmackDown. But yeah, for me, it's the it's the best time to be a wrestling fan since the nineties. Right yeah. now, and we're blessed to see the start of it all from from left and right and I think at this point in time I'd, I say NXT's been more quality and you have like the war games but when I wake up AEW is the first one I watch yeah so I think yeah although Vince the god I won't let him keep me down but AEW is at, at this point in time my priority of watching so Queenie we, for our listeners, let them know what you've got coming up, where they can find you, and any messages going into the Christmas holidays. <laughs> well, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me on Kurt's Angle. I'm so excited for you, buddy. Uh, this is going to be super fun, and I'm excited to uh, to be a part of it. So uh, y'all can find me at the Queen of Any on Twitter and at X the Queen of Any on Instagram. Uh, my show, Queen's Court, drops every single Wednesday as part of one half of the hashtag Queen and Pup connection with our pal JPQ on no particular angle. Um, this week is a very special episode of Queenie Guides, which is my series about guiding towards different promotions. It's all about GCW, Game Changer Wrestling. So that drops uh, this Wednesday, which is the 4th. Um, coming up, I have a really exciting brand new series for the holiday season called Queenie Suggests, and it's all about promoting podcasts that I feel people should listen to that I don't think enough people listen to. So that's dropping in the coming weeks. And as we get to their holiday season, y'all just enjoy your time with your friends and family. Enjoy wrestling because Wrestle Kingdom is coming for New Japan, honey, and that's where it's at. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> Um, and for the suggestions, cough, cough, Kurt Stangle and Ringsider. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's been lovely having you. And for our listeners as well, make sure you check out The Queen. You can check her out again on what will be episode three, where we're talking about one more match. It's a segment that I will be doing with all of my guests or wrestling interviews. However, we're not giving you it today. I think we've given you enough with the Wednesday Night Wars. But coming in episode three, it'll be myself speaking about one more match of who I'd want from a male wrestler, a female wrestler, and a tag team. And then Queenie will give some of her thoughts. I will try and get... I should have the boys from Ringsider, Jamie and Callum, giving their one more matches. And I also have the WWE NXT UK superstar, the Kiwi buzzsaw, Travis Banks, giving his one more match if it was him to face these people. So make sure you check out episode three. Make sure you check out episode one if you haven't already with my interview with NWA's La Mera Mera Thunder Rosa. 
And this has been the Wednesday Night Wars story so far. Hopefully, Queen, we can get back together, do part two in a few months' time, maybe after the next pay-per-view, March time, April, see how the next three months have transpired. And, yeah, we'll break it down for our listeners again. That sounds lovely. It would be my pleasure. Brilliant. So, guys, if you have just found me on Anchor or on YouTube, you can follow the account at Kurt's Angle Pod. You can follow me at Kurt Johansson 93 And follow me on Ringsider, where you can hear me every week at Ringsider Pod. And as a shout-out to my fellow Ringsider brothers, you can listen to Jamie's new show called Bell to Bell, which you can find at Bell to Bell. And when we say Bell, it's the number two, so T-W-O. And now Callum, he's going to be giving you your NXT fix. At Talking Takeover, he's going to be talking all things NXT, NXT UK, TakeOver event, and doing some retrospectives on early TakeOver shows, maybe the champions and things like that. So we've got you covered weekly, and we've got you covered on our own individual shows. Make sure you check those out. I've been Kate Johansson. This has been the Queen of NE. Thank you for listening.